At the start of his formal ministry, Jesus went to John the Baptist to be baptized. When John protested, Jesus insisted, saying that in being baptized, he was fulfilling all righteousness. By this statement, Jesus meant that even he, the only perfect man, who really had no need to be washed clean, was required to be baptized for the commandment's sake. The Book of Mormon prophet Nephi explained that in spite of his being holy, the Savior was humble and would keep all the commandments of his Father. We know he accomplished everything his father asked him to do, as he himself told Joseph Smith, and thereby became perfected, as he told the Nephites. In order to fulfill all his father's commandments, Jesus had to submit himself to every ordinance of the gospel. The ordinances are commandments as well. The ordinance of baptism by John was only the first step. To fulfill all righteousness, he had to receive all the ordinances. We know from the Restoration that these commandments and ordinances must have included receiving the Melchizedek Priesthood, the endowment, marriage in the new and everlasting covenant, and the fullness of the priesthood. Jesus Christ was required to receive these in mortality as we all are. While the scriptural record does not explicitly state the particulars of each of these ordinances, it does provide strong circumstantial evidence that he did, indeed, receive these ordinances during his lifetime. The Apostle Paul mentioned on more than one occasion that Jesus Christ was a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Though we don't have an account of the actual ordination of the Savior, Paul explained in his epistle to the Hebrews that he was given the office of high priest by the Father himself. Presumably, this was a private event, which did not make it into the Gospels. Near the end of his ministry, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up into a high mountain and became transfigured before them. Though the scriptural account does not explain the purpose of the visit, as the apostles were sworn to secrecy at the time, the text does give several clues as to what happened. First, Moses and Elias appeared unto the Savior just as they had appeared unto Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery at the Kirtland Temple. It is more than likely that these angels gave the Savior priesthood keys, just as they had done with Joseph. Furthermore, they had the authority to administer the Temple Endowment. Second, Peter recognized the sacredness of the event and sought to erect three portable temples or tabernacles to commemorate what had just happened. Third, the father appeared to his son expressing approbation. One of the primary purposes of the endowment is to prepare the initiate to enter the presence of God, which is what happened upon the mount. While it cannot be proven that this is what took place, we do know that Jesus had to receive the endowment to become perfect and qualify to perform his mission. He also had to receive his endowment before receiving the fullness of the priesthood or second anointing. Which brings us to Joseph Smith's explanation of what happened on the mount. Joseph Smith unequivocally stated that Jesus received the fullness of the priesthood on the mount. The fullness of the priesthood is to become a king and a priest, holding the keys of power and blessings. 
Joseph further explained that to receive the fullness of the priesthood, one must first obey all commandments and ordinances. This is what Jesus did, as Joseph plainly indicates. It is likely that Jesus first received his endowment on the mount, and then his second anointing. We know that he had already entered into the new and everlasting covenant of marriage prior to this experience. One of the ordinances that must be received before becoming a king and a priest and qualifying for the highest degree of the celestial kingdom is the sealing of husband and wife under the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. Jesus Christ, by the requirements of his own gospel, was required to marry in mortality. The scriptures do not specifically state that he married, but do provide extensive evidence that he did so. According to Latter-day Apostles, we know that Mary and Martha, among others, were his wives. Heber C. Kimball, first counselor to Brigham Young, openly taught in conference that Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene were wives of the Savior. The modern church reaffirmed the fact that marriage is a commandment and has never been withdrawn. No exception was made for Jesus Christ. When the Savior submitted to John to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness, it was merely his first step of receiving all the ordinances of exaltation within his gospel. When the full record is known, we will learn that Jesus Christ complied with all the commandments and received all the ordinances. Only in this way could he have qualified to be our Redeemer and to merit eternal life himself.